द बुद्ध इज लाइफ एंड टीचिंग बाय पियदासी तेरो नमो तस् भगवतो अरहतो सम्मा संबुद्धस् इंट्रोडक्शन द एजेस रोल बाय एंड द बुद्ध सीम्स नॉट far away after all his voice whispers in our ears and tells us not to run away from the struggle but calm eyed to face it and to see in life ever greater opportunities for growth and advancement personality counts today as ever and a person who has impressed himself on the thought of mankind as the buddha has so that even today there is something living and vibrant about the thought of him must have been a wonderful man the man who was as bart says the finish and model of calm and sweet majesty of infinite tenderness for all that breathes and compassion for all that suffers of perfect moral freedom and exemption from every prejudice his message old and yet very new and original for those immersed in metaphysical subtleties captured the imagination of the intellectuals it went deep down into the hearts of the people buddhism had its birth at sarnath near the city of varanasi benares india with only five followers at the beginning it penetrated into many lands and is today the religion of more than 600 million buddhism made such rapid stride chiefly due to its instinct worth and its appeal to the reasoning mind but there were other factors that aided its progress never did the dhamma dutas the messengers of the dhamma the teaching use any incautious method in spreading the dhamma the only weapon they wield was that of universal love and compassion furthermore buddhism penetrated to these countries peaceably without disturbing the creeds that were already there Buddhist missions to which the annals of religious history scarcely afford a parallel were carried on neither by force of arms nor by the use of any coercive or reprehensible methods conversion by compulsion was unknown among the buddhists and repugnant of the buddha and his disciples no decline of other creeds has ever existed in buddhism buddhism was thus able to diffuse itself through a great variety of cultures throughout the civilized world there is no record known to me wrote t w rees davids in the whole of the long history of buddhism throughout the many centuries where its followers have been for such lengthened period supreme of any persecution by the buddhists of the followers of any other faith the birth the buddha the founder of buddhism lived over 2500 years ago and he is known as siddhartha gautama his father suddhodana the kshatriya king ruled over the land of the sakyans at kapilavattu on the nepalese 
frontier as he came from the gotama family he was known as suddodana gotama mahamaya princess of the kolyas was suddodana's queen in 623 bce on a full moon day of may vasanta tide when in india the trees were laden with leaf flower and fruit and man bird and beast were in joyous mood queen mahamaya was traveling in the state of kapilavattu to devadaha her parental home according to the custom of the times to give birth to her child but that was not to be for half way between the two cities in the beautiful lumbini grove under the shade of flowering sal tree she brought forth a son lumbini or rumen day the name by which it is now known is 100 miles north of varanasi and within sight of the snow capped himalayas at this memorable spot where prince siddhartha the future buddha was born emperor asoka 316 years after the event erected a mighty stone pillar to mark the holy spot the inscription engraved on the pillar in five lines consist of 93 asokan characters among which occurs the following hid budde jate sakya muni he was born the buddha the sage of the sakyas the mighty kalam is still to be seen the pillar as crisp as the day it was cut had been struck by lightning even when hyun sian the chinese pilgrim saw it towards the middle of the 7th century ce the discovery and identification of lumbini park in 1896 is attributed to the renowned archaeologist general cunningham On the 5th day after the birth of the prince the king summoned eight white men to choose a name for the child and to speak of the royal babe's future he was named siddhartha which means one whose purpose has been achieved the brahmins deliberated and seven of them held up two fingers each and declared o king this prince will become a chakravarti a universal monarch should he deign to rule but should he renounce the world he will become a samma sambuddha a supremely enlightened one and deliver humanity from ignorance but kondanya the wisest and the youngest after watching the prince held up only one finger and said o king this prince will one day go in search of truth and become a supremely enlightened buddha queen mahamaya the mother passed away on the seventh day after the birth of her child and the babe was nursed by his mother's sister pajapati gotami though the child was nurtured till manhood in refinement amid an abundance of material luxury the father did not fail to give his son the education that a prince ought to receive he became skilled in many branches of knowledge and in the arts of war easily
exalt all others nevertheless from his childhood the prince was given to serious contemplation the four significant visions when the prince grew up the father's fervent wish was that his son should marry bring up a family and be his worthy successor for he often recalled to mind with dread the prediction of the sage kondanya and feared that the prince would one day give up home for the homeless life of an ascetic according to the custom of the time at the early age of 16 the prince was married to his cousin the beautiful princess yasodhara the only daughter of king superbuddha and queen pamita of the kolyas the princess was of the same age as the prince his father provided him with the greatest comforts he had so the story tells three palaces one for each of the indian years three seasons lacking nothing of the earthly joys of life he lived amid song and dance in luxury and pleasure knowing nothing of sorrow yet all the effort of the father to hold his son a prisoner to the senses and make him worldly minded were of no avail king suddodana's endeavors to keep away life miseries from his son's inquiring eyes only heightened prince siddhartha's curiosity and his resolute search for truth and enlightenment with the advance of age and maturity the prince began to glimpse the woes of the world on one occasion when the prince went driving with his charioteer channa to the royal gardens he saw to his amazement what his eyes had never beheld before a man weakened with age and in the last stage of aging crying out in the mournful voice help master lift me to my feet or oh, help or oh, i shall die before i reach my house this was the first shock the prince received the second was the sight of a man mere skin and bone supremely unhappy and forlorn smitten with some pest the strength is gone from ham and loin and neck and all the grace and joy of manhood fled on a third occasion he saw a band of lamenting kinsmen bearing on their shoulders a corpse of one beloved for cremation these woeful signs seen for the first time in his life deeply moved him from the charioteer he learned that even he his beloved princess yasodhara and his kith and kin all without exception are subject to aging disease and death soon after this the prince saw a recluse moving with measured steps and downcast eyes calm and serene aloof and independent he was struck by the serene countenance of the man he learned from channa that this recluse was one who had abandoned his home to live a life of purity to seek truth 
and answer the riddle of life. Thoughts of renunciation flash through the prince's mind and in deep contemplation he turned homeward. The heart throbbed of an agonized and alien humanity found a re responsive echo in his own heart. The more he came in contact with the world outside his palace walls, the more convinced he became that the world was lacking in true happiness. But before reaching the palace, he was met by a messenger with the news that a son had been born to Yasodhara. A fetter is set upon me, uttered the prince and returned to the palace. The Great Renunciation in the silence of that moonlit night, it was the full moon day of July, Asalha. Such thought as this arose in him, youth, the prime of life, ends in old age, and man's senses fail him at a time when they are most needed. The hale and hearty lost their vigor and health when disease suddenly creeps in. Finally, death comes, sudden perhaps and unexpected, and puts an end to this brief span of life. Surely, there must be an escape from this unsatisfactoriness from aging and death. Thus the great intoxication of youth, Yobbana mother, of health, Arogya mother, and of life, Jivita mother, left him. Having seen the vanity and the danger of the three intoxications, he was overcome by a powerful urge to seek and win the deathless to strive for deliverance from old age, illness, misery and death, not only for himself, but for all beings, including his wife and child, that suffer. It was his deep compassion that led him to the quest ending in enlightenment in Buddhahood. It was compassion that now moved his heart towards the great renunciation and opened for him the doors of the golden cage of his home life. It was compassion that made his determination unshakable even by the last parting glance at his beloved wife asleep with the baby in her arms. Thus, at age of twenty-nine, the flower of youthful manhood, on the day his beautiful Yasodhara had given birth to his only son, Rahula, Prince Siddhartha Gautama, discarding and disdaining the enchantment of the royal life, scorning and spurning joys that most young men yearn for, tore himself away, renouncing wife and child, and a crown that held the promise of power and glory. He cut off his long locks with his sword, doffed his royal robes, and putting on a hermit's robe, retreated into forest solitude to seek a solution to those problems of life that had so deeply stirred his mind. He sought an answer to the riddle of life seeking not a palliative but a true way out of suffering, to perfect enlightenment and Nibbana. His quest for the supreme security from bondage, Nibbana, Nirvana, had begun. This was the great renunciation, the greatest adventure known to humanity.
First, he sought guidance from two famous sages from Alar Kalama and Uddhaka Ramaputta, hoping that they, being masters of meditation, would teach him all they knew, leading him to the highest of concentrative thought. He practiced concentration and reached the highest meditative attainments possible thereby but was not satisfied with anything short of supreme enlightenment. These teachers' range of knowledge, their ambit of mystical experience, however, was insufficient to grant him what he so earnestly sought, and he saw himself still far from his goal. Though both sages in turn asked him to stay and succeed them as the teacher of their following, the ascetic Gautama declined. Paying obeisance to them, he left them in search of the still unknown. In his wanderings, he finally reached Uruvela by the river Neranjana at Gaya. He was attracted by its quiet and dense groves, and the clear waters of the river were soothing to his senses and stimulating to his mind. Nearby was a village of simple folk where he could get his arms. Finding that this was a decided by stay, Soon five others ascetics who admired his determined effort joined him. They were Kondanya, Badya, Vapa, Mahanama and Asaji. Self-mortification There was and still is a belief in India among many of her ascetics that purification and final deliverance can be achieved by rigorous self-mortification and the ascetic Gautama decided to test the truth of it. And so there at Uruvela he began a determined struggle to subdue his body in the hope that his mind, set free from the shackles of the body, might be able to soar to the heights of liberation. Most zealous was he in these practices. He lived on leaves and roots on a steadily reduced pittance of food. He wore rags from dust heaps. He slept among corpses or on beds of thorns. The utter paucity of nourishment left him a physical wreck, says the master. Rigorous have I been in my ascetic discipline. Rigorous have I been beyond all others. Like wasted, withered reeds became all my limbs. In such words as these in later years, having attained to full enlightenment did the Buddha give his disciples an Avainsprin's description of his early penises. Struggling thus for six long years, he came to death's very door, but he found himself no nearer to his goal. The utter futility of self-mortification became abundantly clear to him by his own experience. He realized that the path to the fruition of his ardent longing lay in the direction of a search inward into his own mind. Undiscourage his still active mind, search for new paths to the aspired for goal. He felt, however, that with a body so utterly weakened as his, he could not follow the path with any chance of success. Thus he abandoned self-torture and extreme fasting and took normal food. His 
emaciated body recovered its former health and his exhausted vigor soon returned now his five companions left him in their disappointment for they thought that he had given up the effort and had resumed a life of abundance nevertheless with firm determination and complete faith in his own purity and strength unaided by any teacher accompanied by none the bodhisattva resolved to make his final effort in complete solitude on the forenoon of the day before his enlightenment while the bodhisattva was seated in meditation under a banyan tree sujata the daughter of a rich householder not knowing whether the ascetic was divine or human offered milk rice to him saying lord may your aspirations be crowned with success this was his last meal prior to his enlightenment the final triumph cross leg he sat under a tree which later became known as the bodhi tree the tree of enlightenment or tree of wisdom on the bank of the river neranjara at gaya now known as buddha gaya making the final effort with the inflexible resolution though only my skin sinews and bones remain and my blood and flesh dry up and wither away yet i will never stir from this seat until i have attained full enlightenment samma sambodhi so in defatigable in effort so unflagging in his devotion was he and so resolute to realize truth and attain full enlightenment applying himself to the mindfulness of in and out breathing anapansati the bodhisattva entered upon and dwelt in the first meditative absorption jhana sanskrit dhyana by gradual stages he entered upon and dwelt in the second third and fourth jhanas thus cleansing his mind of impurities with the mind thus composed he directed it to the knowledge of recollecting past birth pubbe nivanu satyana this was the first knowledge attained by him in the first watch of the night then the bodhisattva directed his mind to the knowledge of the disappearing and reappearing of beings of varied forms in good states of experience and in states of war each faring according to his deeds chutu padnyana this was the second knowledge attained by him in the middle watch of the night next he directed his mind to the knowledge of the eradication of the taints asavakkhayan he understood as it really is this is suffering dukkha this is the arising of suffering this is the cessation of suffering this is the path leading to the cessation of suffering he understood as it really is these are defilement asavas this is the arising of defilement this is the cessation of defilements this is the path leading to the cessation of defilements knowing thus see in thus his mind was liberated from the defilement of sense pleasure kama sava of becoming bhava sava and of ignorance avijja sava when his mind was thus liberated there came the knowledge liberated and he understood 
destroyed his birth the noble life brahmacharya has been lived done is what was to be done there is no more of this to come meaning there is no more continuity of the mind and body no more becoming rebirth this was the third knowledge attained by him in the last watch of the night this is known as tevijja sanskrit trividya threefold knowledge thereupon he spoke these words of victory seeking but not finding the house builder i hurried through the round of many births painful is birth ever and again o house builder you have been seen you shall not build the house again your rafters have been broken up your rich pole is demolished too my mind has now attained the unformed nibbana and reach the end of every sort of craving thus the bodhisattva gotama at the age of 35 on another full moon of may vesak vesak attained supreme enlightenment by comprehending in all their fullness for noble truth the eternal verities and he became the buddha the great healer and consummate master physician who can cure ills of beings this is the greatest unshakable victory the four noble truths are the priceless message that the buddha gave to suffering humanity for their guidance to help them to be rid of the bondage of dukkha and to attain the absolute happiness that absolute reality nibbana these truths are not his creation he only rediscovered their existence we thus have in the buddha one who deserves our respect and reverence not only as a teacher but also as model of the noble self sacrificing and meditative life we would do well to follow if we wish to improve ourselves one of the noteworthy characteristics that distinguishes the buddha from all other religious teachers is that he was a human being having no connection whatsoever with a god or any other supernatural being he was neither god no an incarnation of god no a prophet no any mythological figure he was a man but an extraordinary man acharya manusya a unique being a man per excellence purisuttama all his achievements are attributed to his human effort and his human understanding through personal experience he understood the supremacy of man depending on his own unremitting energy unaided by any teacher human or divine he achieved the highest mental and intellectual attainments reached the acme of purity and was perfect in the best qualities of human nature he was an embodiment of compassion and wisdom which became the two guiding principles in his dispensation sasana the buddha never claimed to be a savior who tried to save souls by means of a revealed religion through his own perseverance and understanding he proved that 
infinite potentialities are latent in man and that it must be man's endeavor to develop and unfold these possibilities. He proved by his own experience that deliverance and enlightenment lie fully within man's range of effort. Religion of the highest and fullest character can coexist with a complete absence of belief in revelation in any straightforward sense of the word and in that kernel of revealed religion, a personal God. Under the term personal God, I include all ideas of a so-called super-personal God of the same spiritual and mental nature as a personality, but on a higher level, or indeed any supernatural spiritual existence or force. Julian Huxley, Religion Without Revelation, page 2 and 7. Each individual should make the appropriate effort and break the shackles that have kept him in bondage, winning freedom from the bonds of existence by perseverance, self-exertion and insight. It was the Buddha who for the first time in the world history taught that deliverance could be attained independently of an external agency, that deliverance from suffering must be wrought and fashioned by each one for himself upon the anvil of his own actions. None can grant deliverance to another who merely begs for it. Others may lend us a helping and hand by guidance and instruction and in other ways but the highest freedom is attained only through self-realization and self-awakening to truth and not through prayers and petitions to the supreme being, human or divine. The Buddha warns his disciples against shifting the burden to an external agency, directs them to the way of discrimination and research and urge them to get busy with the real task of developing their inner forces and qualities. Misconceptions There are some who take delight in making the Buddhas a non-human. They quote a passage from the Anguttara Nikaya. Mis translate it and misunderstood it. The story goes thus. Once the Buddha was seated under a tree in the meditation posture, his senses calm and his mind quiet and attained to supreme control and serenity. Then a Brahmin donor by name approached the Buddha and asked, Sir, will you be a god a Deva, no Brahmin. Sir, will you be a heavenly angel, a Gandhab, no Brahmin. Sir, will you be a demon, a Yakka, no Brahmin. Sir, will you be a human being, a Manusa, no Brahmin. Then, sir, what indeed will you be? Now understand the Buddha's reply carefully. Brahmin, Whatever defilements are servers, they are be owning to the presence of which a person may be identified as a god or a heavenly angel or a demon or a human being. All these defilements in me are abandoned, cut off at the root, made like a palm tree stump, done away with and are no more subject to future arising. Just as Brahmin, a blue or red or white lotus born in water, grows in water and stands up above the water untouched by it, so too I who was born in the world and grew up in the world 
have transcended the world and I live untouched by the world. Remember me as one who is enlightened. Buddha Timan Dharehi Brahmana. What the Buddha said was that he was not a god or a heavenly angel or a demon or a human being full of defilements. From the above, it is clear that the Buddha wanted the Brahmin to know that he was not a human being with defilements. He did not want the Brahmin to put him into any of those categories. The Buddha was in the world but not of the world. This is clear from the simile of the lotus. Harshly, critics, however, rush to a wrong conclusion and warn others to believe that the Buddha was not a human being. In the Anguttara Nikaya, there is a clear instance in which the Buddha categorically declared that he was a human being. Monks, there is one person, Puggala, whose birth into this world is for the welfare and happiness of many, out of compassion for the world, for the gain and welfare and happiness of gods, devas and humanity. Who is this one person, Eka Puggala? It is the Tathagata. Who is the worthy one, Arahant, a supremely enlightened one, Sammasambuddho? Monks, the person born into the world is an extraordinary man, a marvelous man, Acharya Manusa. Note the Pali word Manusa, a human being. Yes, the Buddha was a human being, but not just another man. He was a marvelous man. The Buddhist texts say that the Bodhisattva, as he is known before he became the Buddha, was in the Tusita heaven, Deva Loka, but came down to the human world to be born as a human being, Manusattva. His parents, King Suddhodana and Queen Mahamaya, were human beings. The Bodhisattva was born as a man, Attain enlightenment Buddhahood as a man and finally passed away into Parinibbana as a man. Even after his supreme enlightenment, he did not call himself a god or Brahma or any supernatural being but an extraordinary man. Dr. S. Radhakrishnan, a Hindu steep in the Tenets of the Vedas and Vedanta says that Buddhism is an offshoot of Hinduism and even goes to the extent of calling the Buddha a Hindu. He writes, The Buddha did not feel that he was announcing a new religion. He was born, grew up and died a Hindu. He was restating with a new emphasis, the ancient ideas of the Indo-Aryan civilization. But the Buddha himself declares that his teaching was a revelation of truth discovered by himself, not known to his contemporaries, not inherited from past tradition. Thus, in his very first sermon, referring to the for noble truth, he says, monks, with a thought, this is the noble truth of suffering. This is its cause, this is its cessation, this is the way leading to its cessation. There arose in me vision, knowledge, wisdom, insight and light concerning things unheard before Again, while making clear to his disciples the difference between a fully enlightened one and the arahats, the consummate ones, the Buddha says, the Tathagata or disciples while being an arahant is fully enlightened. It is he who proclaims a way not proclaimed before. 
He is the knower of a way, who understands a way, who is skilled in a way. Magganyo, Maggavidu, Maggakovidu. And now his disciples are wayfarers who follow in his footsteps. The ancient way of the Buddha refers to is the noble eightfold path and not any ideals of the Indo-Aryan civilization as Dr. Radhakrishnan imagines. However, referring to the Buddha, Mahatma Gandhi, the architects of Indian independence says, by his immense sacrifice, by his great renunciation and by the immaculate purity of his life, he left an indelible impress upon Hinduism and Hinduism owes an eternal debt of gratitude to that great teacher, Mahadev Desai, with Gandhiji in Ceylon, Madras, 1928, page 26. Dependent Arising For a week immediately after the enlightenment, the Buddha sat at the foot of the Bodhi tree, experiencing the supreme bliss of emancipation. At the end of the seven days, he emerged from that concentration, Samadhi, and in the first watch of the night, thought over the dependent arising, Paticca Samuppada, as to how things arise, Anuloma, thus, when disease that comes to be, with the arising of this, that arises, namely, dependent on ignorance, volitional or karma formations, dependent on volitional formations, rebirth or rebecoming, consciousness, dependent on consciousness, mentality, materiality, mental and physical combination, dependent on mentality, materiality, the sixfold base, the five physical sense organs with consciousness as the sixth. Depend on the sixth base, contact. Dependent on contact, feeling. Dependent on feeling, craving. Dependent on craving, clinging. Dependent on clinging, the process of becoming. Dependent on the process of becoming, there comes to be birth. Dependent on birth, arise aging and death. Sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair. Thus does this whole mass of suffering arise. In the second watch of the night, the Buddha thought over the dependent arising as to how things cease, patiloma, thus. When this is not, that does not come to be. With the cessation of this, that ceases, namely, with the utter cessation of ignorance, the cessation of volitional formations. With the cessation of formations, the cessation of consciousness, and so on. Thus does this whole mass of suffering cease. In the third watch of the night, the Buddha thought over the dependent arising, both as to how things arise and cease thus. When this is, that comes to be. With the arising of this, that arises. When this is not, that does not come to be. With the cessation of this, that ceases. Namely, dependent on ignorance, volitional formation, and so on. Thus does 
this whole mass of suffering arise with the utter cessation of ignorance the cessation of volitional formations and so on thus does this thus does this whole mass of suffering cease the buddha now spent six more weeks in lonely retreat at six different spots in the vicinity of the bodhi tree at the end of this period two merchants tapassu and bhallika who were passing that way offered rice cake and honey to the master and said we go for refuge to the buddha and to the dhamma let the blessed one receive us as his followers they became this first lay followers upasakas the first sermon now while the blessed one dwelt in solitude this thought occurred to him the dhamma i have realized is deep hard to see hard to understand peaceful and sublime beyond mere reasoning subtle and intelligible to the wise but this generation delights revels and rejoices in sensual pleasures it is hard for such a generation to see this conditionality this dependent arising hard to is it to see this calming of all conditioned things the giving up of all substance of becoming the extinction of craving this passion cessation nibbana and if i were to teach the dhamma and others were not to understand me that would be a weariness a vexation for me pondering thus he was first reluctant to teach the dhamma but on surveying the world with his mental eye he saw beings with little dust in their eyes and with much dust in their eyes with keen faculties and dull faculties with good qualities and bad qualities easy to teach and hard to teach some who are alive to perils hereafter of present wrong doings and some who are not the master then declared his readiness to proclaim the dhamma in this solemn utterance aparuta tesang amatas dwara yesot vanto pamuchantu saddham open are the doors of the deathless let those that have ears repose trust when considering to whom he should teach the dhamma first he thought of alara kalama and uddaka ramaputta his teachers of old for he knew that they were wise and discerning but that was not to be they had passed away then the blessed one made up his mind to make known the truth to those five ascetics his former friends still steeped in the fruitless rigorous of extreme asceticism knowing that they were living at benas in the deer park at isipatana the resort of seers modern saranath the blessed one left gaya for distant benas walking by stages some 150 miles on the way not far from gaya the buddha was met by upaka an ascetic who struck by the serene appearance of the master inquired who is your teacher whose teaching do you profess the buddha replied i have no teacher 
one like me does not exist in all the world for i am the peerless teacher the arahat i alone am supremely enlightened quenching all defilements nibbana's calm have i attained i go to the city of kasi benas to set in motion the wheel of dhamma in a world where blindness reigns i shall be the deathless drum friend you then claim you are a universal victor said upaka the buddha replied those who have attained the cessation of defilements they are indeed victors like me all evil have i vanquished hence i am a victor upaka shook his head remarking sarcastically it may be so friend and took a bypath the buddha continued his journey and in gradual stages reach the deer park at isipatana the five ascetics see in the buddha from afar discuss among themselves friends here comes the ascetic gotama who gave up the struggle and turned to a life of abundance and luxury let us make no kind of salutation to him but when the buddha approached them they were struck by his defined presence and they failed in their resolve one went to meet him and took his arm bowl and robe another prepared a seat still another brought him water the buddha sat on the seat prepared for him and the five ascetics then addressed him by name and greeted him as an equal saying also friends the buddha said address not to tathagata perfect one by the word also the tathagata monks is consummate one arahan a supremely enlightened one give ear monks the deathless has been attained i shall instruct you i shall teach you the dhamma following my teaching you will know and realize for yourself even in this lifetime that supreme goal of purity for the sake of which clansmen retire from home to follow the homeless life thereupon the five monks said friends gotama even with the stern austerities penances and self torture you practice you fail to attain the superhuman vision and insight now that you are living a life of luxury and self indulgence and have given up the struggle how could you have reached superhuman vision and insight then replied the buddha the tathagata has not ceased from effort and reverted to a life of luxury and abundance the tathagata is a supremely enlightened one give ear monks the deathless has been attained i shall instruct you i shall teach you the dhamma a second time the monk said the same thing to the buddha who gave the same answer a second time a third time they repeated the same question in spite of the assurance given by the master they did not change their attitude then the buddha spoke to them thus confess o monks did i ever speak to you in this way before touched by this appeal of the blessed one the five ascetics submitted and said no indeed lord thus did the supreme sage the tamed one tame hearts of the five ascetics with patience and kindness 
with wisdom and skill, overcome and convinced by his utterance, the monks indicated their readiness to listen to him. The Middle Path Now, on a full moon day of July, 589 years before Christ, in the evening, at the moment the sun was setting and the full moon simultaneously rising, in the shady deer park at Spatana, the Buddha addressed them. Monks, these two extremes ought not to be cultivated by the recluse. What to? Sensual indulgence, which is low, vulgar, worldly, ignoble, and conducive to harm, and self-mortification, which is painful, ignoble, and conducive to harm. The middle path, monks understood by the Tathagata, avoiding the extremes, gives vision and knowledge and leads to calm, realization, enlightenment, and Nibbana. And what, monks, is that middle path? It is this noble eightfold path, namely, right understanding, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. Then the Buddha explains to them the four noble truths, the noble truth of suffering, the noble truth of arising of suffering, the noble truth of cessation of suffering, and the noble truth of the way leading to the cessation of suffering. Thus did the Supreme Buddha proclaim the truth and set in motion the wheel of the Dhamma, Dhamma Chakka Pavatana. This first discourse, this message of the Deer Park, is the core of the Buddha's teaching. As the footprint of every creature that walks the earth could be included in the elephant's footprint, which is preeminent for size, so does the doctrine of the Four Noble Truths embrace the entire teaching of the Buddha. Explaining each of the Four Noble Truths, the Master said, such monks was the vision, the knowledge, the wisdom, the insight, the light that arose in me, that I gained about things not heard before, as long as monks my intuitive knowledge, my vision in regard to these four noble truths was not absolutely clear to me. I did not claim that I had gained the incomparable supreme enlightenment. But when monks, my intuitive knowledge, my vision in regard to these four noble truths was absolutely clear to me, then only did I claim that I had gained the incomparable supreme enlightenment and there arose in me insight and vision. Unshakable is the deliverance of my mind. Akuppa me cheto vimutti. This is my last birth. There is no more becoming rebirth. Thus spoke the Buddha. And the five monks, glad at heart, applauded the words of the Blessed One. On December 2nd, 1930, at the royal dinner at King's Palace, Sweden, when it was his turn to speak, Sir C. Venkata Raman, the Nobel Prize winning physicist, left aside science and, to the surprise of the renowned guest, delivered a most powerful address on the Buddha and India's past glories. In the vicinity of Benas, said Sir Vekanta Raman, there exists a path which is for me the most sacred place in India. This path was one day 
travelled over by the prince Siddhartha. After he had gotten rid of all his worldly possessions in order to go through the world and proclaim the annunciation of love, the Sinsapa grow. The supremacy of the Four Noble Truths in the teaching of the Buddha is abundantly clear from the message of the Sinsapa grow as from the message of the deer park. Once the Blessed One was living at Kosambi near Allahabad in the Sinsapa grove, then gathering a few Sinsapa leaves in his hand, the Blessed One addressed the monks. What do you think, monks, which is greater in quantity? The handful of Sinsapa leaves gathered by me or what is in the forest overhead? Not many trifling venerable sir are the leaves in the handful gathered by the Blessed One. Many are the leaves in the forest overhead. Even so, monks, many are those things I have fully realized but not declared to you. Few are things I have declared to you. And why, monks, have I not declared them? They, monks, are not useful, are not essential to the life of purity. They do not lead to the disgust, to dispassion, to cessation, to tranquility, to full understanding, to full enlightenment, to Nibbana. That is why, monks, they are not declared by me. And what is it, monks, that I have declared? This is suffering. This have I declared. This is the arising of suffering. This have I declared. This is the cessation of suffering. This have I declared. This is the path leading to the cessation of suffering. This have I declared. And why, monks, have I declared these truths? They are indeed useful, are essential to the life of purity. They lead to disgust, to dispassion, to cessation, to tranquility, to full understanding, to enlightenment, to nibbana. That is why, monks, they are declared by me. Therefore, monks, an effort should be made to realize this is suffering, this is the arising of suffering, this is the cessation of suffering, this is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. The Buddha has empirically said, One thing do I make known, suffering and cessation of suffering. Dukkan cheva panya pemi dukkha sacha nirodham. To understand this unequal saying is to understand Buddhism. For the entire teaching of the Buddha is nothing else than the application of this one principle. What can be called the discovery of a Buddha is just these four noble truths. This is the typical teaching of the Buddhas of all ages. The Peerless Physician The Buddha is known as the Peerless Physician, Bisakko, the Supreme Surgeon, Sallakato Anuttaro. He indeed is an unrivaled healer. The Buddha's method of exposition of the Four Noble Truths is comparable to that of a physician. As a physician, he first diagnosed the illness. Next, he discovered the cause for the arising of the illness. Then he considered its removal and lastly applied the remedy. Suffering Dukkha is the illness. Craving Tanna is the arising or the root cause of the illness. 
சமுதய த்ரூ த ரிமூவல் ஆஃப் கிரேவிங் தி இல்னஸ் இஸ் ரிமூவ்ட் அண்ட் தட் இஸ் த கியோ நிரோத நிபானு த நோபல் எயிட் ஃபால் பாத் மக் இஸ் த ரெமடி the buddha replied to a brahmin who wished to know why the master is called a buddha clearly indicates that it was for no other reason than a perfect knowledge of the four noble truths here is the buddha's reply i knew what should be known what should be cultivated i have cultivated what should be abandoned that how i let go hence o brahmin i am buddha the awakened one with the proclamation of the dhamma for the first time with the setting in motion of the wheel of dhamma and with the conversion of the five ascetics the deer park at isipatana became the birthplace of the buddha's dispensation sasana and of his community of monks sangha the spread of the dhamma thereafter the buddha spent the vassa at the deer park at isipatana sacred this day to over 600 million of the human race during these three months of rains 50 other headed by yasa a young man of wealth joined the order now the buddha had 60 disciples all arahants who had realized the dhamma and were fully competent to teach others when the rainy season ended the master addressed his immediate disciples in these words release am i monks from all ties whether human or divine you also are delivered from all fetters whether human or divine go now and wander for the welfare and happiness of many out of compassion for the world for the gain welfare and happiness of gods and men let not two of you proceed in the same direction proclaim the dhamma that is excellent in the beginning excellent in the middle and excellent in the end possess of meaning and the latter and utterly perfect proclaim the life of purity the holy life consummate and pure there are beings with little dust in their eyes who will be lost through not hearing the dhamma there are beings who will understand the dhamma i also shall go to uruvela to sena nigama to teach the dhamma thus did the buddha commence his sublime mission which lasted to the end of his life with his disciples he walked the highways and byways of india enfolded in all within the aura of his boundless compassion and wisdom though the order of monks began its career with 60 bhikkhus it expanded soon into thousands and as a result of the increase in number of monks many monasteries came into being in later times monastic indian universities like nalanda vikramasila jagadala vikramapuri and odantapuri became cultural centers which gradually influenced the whole of asia and through it the mental life of human kind after a successful ministry of 45 years the buddha passed away at the age of 80 at the twin solitaries of the mallas at kusinara in modern uttara pradesh about 120 miles north east of binas the buddha's ministry during his long ministry of 45 years the buddha walked widely throughout the northern districts of india 
but during the rain retreat was he generally stayed in one place here follows a brief sketch of his retreats gathered from the text first year varanasi after the first proclamation of the dhamma on the full moon day of july the buddha spent the first vasa at isipatana varanasi the second third and fourth years rajaga in the bamboo grove velwana it was during the third year that sudatta a householder of savati known for his bounty as anatha pindika the feeder of the forlong having heard that a buddha had come into being went in search of him listen to him and having gained confidence sadda in the teacher the teaching and the taught the buddha dhamma and sangha attained the first stage of sainthood sotapatti he was renowned as the chief supporter daika of the master anatha pindika had built the famous jetavana monastery at savatthi known today as sahet mahet and offered into the buddha and his disciples the ruins of this monastery are still to be seen fifth year vesali the buddha kept retreat in the pinnacled hall kutagara sala it was at this time that king suddhodana fell ill the master visited him and preach the dhamma here in which the king attained perfect sanctity arahatta and after enjoying the bliss of emancipation for 7 days passed away the order of nuns was also founded during this time 6th year mankula hill here the buddha performed the twin bond yamaka pratiharya he did the same for the first time at kapilavattu to overcome the pride of sakyas his relatives seventh year tavatinsa the heaven of the 33 here the buddha preached the abhidhamma or the higher doctrine to the deities devas headed by his mother mahamaya who had passed away 7 days after the birth of prince siddhartha and was reborn as a deva in the tavatins 8 year besakala forest near sunsumargiri it was here that nakula pita and his wife a genial couple came to see the buddha told him about their very happy married life and expressed the wish that they might continue to live together both here and hereafter these two were placed by the buddha as chiefs of those that win confidence ninth year kosambi at the gosit monastery tenth year parileyaka forest it was in the tenth year that at kosambi a dispute a rose between two parties of monks owing to a trivial offense committed by a monk as they could not be reconciled and as they did not pay heed to his exhortation the buddha retired to the forest at the end of the vasa their dispute settled the monks came to savatthi and begged pardon of the buddha lavant year village of ekanala in the magadha country it was here that the buddha met the brahmin farmer kasi bharadwaja who spoke to the buddha somewhat discourteously the buddha however answered his questions with his characteristic sobriety Bharadwaja became an ardent follower of the Buddha it was on this occasion that the very interesting discourse Kasi Bharadwaja Sutta 
Sutta Nipata was delivered. Read the book of protection by the author BPS. Twelfth year, Veranja. The introduction of the winner is attributed to the twelfth year. It was also during this retreat that the Brahmin Veranja came to see the Buddha, asked a series of questions of Buddhist practices, and being satisfied with the answers became a follower of the Blessed One. He invited the Master and the Sangha to spend the rainy season was at his village Veranja. At that time there was a famine. The Buddha and his disciples had to be satisfied with the coarse food supplied by horse merchants. As it was the custom of the Buddha to take leave of the inviter before setting out on his journey, he saw the Brahmin at the end of the Vasa. The latter admitted that Though he had invited the Buddha and his disciples to spend the retreat at Veranja, he had failed in his duties towards them during the entire season owing to his being tax household duties. However, the next day he offered food and gift of robes to the Buddha and the Sangha. Thirteenth year, Chalia Rock near the city of Chalika, during this time, the elder Megya was his personal attendant. The elder, being attracted by a beautiful mango grove near a river, asked the Buddha for permission to go there for meditation. Though the Buddha asked him to wait till another monk came, he repeated the request. The Buddha granted him permission. The elder went, but to his great surprise, he was oppressed by thoughts of sense pleasures, ill will and harm, and returned disappointed. Thereupon the Buddha said, Megya, for the deliverance of the mind of the immature, five things are conducive to their maturing. A good friend, vigorous behavior guided by, by the essential precepts for training, Good counsel tending to dispassion, calm, cessation, enlightenment, and nibbana. The effort to abandon evil thoughts and acquiring of wisdom that discerns the rise and fall of things. Fourteenth year, Jetavana Monastery, Savatthi, during this time, the Venerable Rahula, who was still a novice, Samanera received higher ordination, Upasampada. According to the Vinaya, higher ordination is not conferred before the age of 20. Venerable Raul had then reached that age. Fifteenth year, Kapilavattu, the birthplace of Prince Siddhartha. It was in this year that the death occurred of King Superbuddha the father of Yasodhara. Sixteenth year, city of Alavi. During this year, Alavaka, the demon who devoured human flesh, was tamed by the Buddha. He became a follower of the Buddha. For Alavaka's question and the master's question, read the Alavaka Sutta in the Sutta Nipata. Seventeenth year, Rajaga at Veluana Monastery. During this time, a well known courtesan Sirima, sister of Jivaka, the physician, died. The Buddha attended the funeral and asked the king to inform the people to buy the dead body. The body that attracted so many when she was alive. No one cared to have it even without pay in a price. On that occasion, addressing the crowd, the Buddha said in verse, Behold this painted image, a body full of wounds, heaped up with bones, disease, 
the object of thought of many in which there is neither permanence nor stability. 18th year, Charlie Rock, during this time a young weaver's daughter met the Buddha and listened to his discourse on mindfulness of death, Marnanusati. On another occasion, she answered correctly all the four questions put to her by the Master because she often pondered over the words of the Buddha. Her answers were philosophical and the congregations who had not given a thought to the Buddha, word could not grasp the meaning of her answers. The Buddha, however, praised her in address them in verse thus. Blind is this world, few here clearly see, like a bird that escaped from the net, only a few go to a good state of existence. She heard the Dhamma and attained the first stage of sanctity, Sotapati, but unfortunately she died an untimely death. Nineteenth year, Chalya Rock. Twentieth year, Rajaga at Veluana Monastery. From twenty-first year till the forty-three year, Savati. Of these twenty-four verses, Eighteen were spent at Jetavana Monastery, the rest at Pubba Rama. Anathapindik and Visaka were the chief supporters. Forty-fourth year, Belua, a small village probably situated near Vesali, where the Buddha suppressed by force of will a grave illness. In the forty-fifth year of the Enlightenment, the Buddha passed away at Kusinara in the month of May. Vesaka before the commencement of the rains. During the first twenty years of the Buddha's life, the bhikkhus Nagasamala, Nagita, Upavana, Sunakkata, Sagata, Radha, and Megya and the novice Samanera Chunda attended upon him, though not regularly. However, after the twentieth year, the Buddha wished to have a regular attendant. Thereon, all the great eighty Arahans like Sariputta and Moggallana expressed their willingness to attend upon their master, but this did not meet with his approval. Perhaps the Buddha thought that these arans could be of greater service to humanity. Then the elders requested Ananda Thera, who had kept silent all this while, to beg of the master to be his attendant. Ananda Thera's answer is interesting. He said, if the master is willing to have me as his attendant, he will speak. Then the Buddha said, Ananda, let not others pursue you. You on your own may attend upon me. The Buddhahood and Arahatship Perfect enlightenment, the discovery and realization of the Four Noble Truth." Buddhahood is not the prerogative of a single being chosen by divine providence, nor is it a unique and unrepeatable event in human history. It is an achievement open to anyone who earnestly strives for perfect purity and wisdom, and with inflexible will cultivates the parami the perfections which are the requisites of Buddhahood and the Noble Eightfold Path. There have been Buddhas in the dim past and there will be Buddhas in the future when necessity arises and conditions are favorable. But we need not think of that distant future. Now in our present days, the doors to the deathless are still wide 
open those who enter through them reach in perfect sanctity or arachip the final liberation from suffering nibbana have been solemnly declared by the buddha to be his equals as far as the emancipation from defilements and ultimate deliverance is concerned victors like me are they indeed they who have won defilements end the buddha however also made clear to his disciples the difference between a fully enlightened one and the arahants the accomplished saints the tathagata or disciples while being an arahan is fully enlightened it is he who proclaims a path not proclaimed before he is the knower of a path who understand a path who is skilled in a path and now his disciples are wayfarers who follow in his footsteps that disciples is the distinction the specific feature which distinguishes the tathagata who being an arahant is fully enlightened from the disciple who is freed by insight salient features of the dhamma there are no dark corners of ignorance no cobwebs of mystery no smoky chambers of secrecy there are no secret doctrines no hidden dogmas in the teaching of the buddha which is open as daylight and as clear as crystal the doctrine and discipline proclaimed by the buddha sign when open and not when covered even as the sun and moon shine when open and not when covered the master disapproved of those who profess to have secret doctrines saying secrecy is the whole mark of false doctrines addressing the disciple ananda the master said i have taught the dhamma ananda without making any distinction between exoteric and exoteric doctrine for in respect of the truth ananda the tathagata has no such thing as the crossed fist of a teacher who hides some essential knowledge from the pupil a buddha is an extreme rarity but is so freck in human history he would not preserve his supreme knowledge for himself alone such an idea would be completely ridiculous and abhorrent from the buddhist point of view and to the buddha such a wish is utterly inconceivable driven by universal love and compassion the buddha expounded his teaching without keeping back anything that was essential for man's deliverance from the shackles of sansara repeated wandering the buddha's teaching from beginning to end is open to all those who have eyes to see and a mind to understand buddhism was never forced upon anyone at the point of the gun or the bayonet conversion by compulsion was unknown among buddhist and repugnant to the buddha of the buddha's creed of compassion h field in hall writes in the soul of a people there can never be a war of buddhism no ravished country has ever borne witness to the prowess of the followers of the buddha no murdered men have poured out their blood on their hearthstones killed in his name no ruined women have cursed his same to high heaven 
he and his faith are clean of the stain of blood he was the preacher of the great peace of love of charity of compassion and so clear is his teaching that it can never be misunderstood when communicating the dhamma to his disciples the master made no distinctions whatsoever among them for there were no specially chosen favorite disciples among his disciples all those who were arahants who were passion free and had shed of fetters binding to renewed existence had equally perfected themselves in purity but there were some outstanding ones who were skilled in different branches of knowledge and practice and because of their mental endowments they gained positions of distinction but special favors were never granted to anyone by the master upali for instance who came from a barber's family was made the chief in matters of discipline vinay in preference to many arahants who belonged to the class of the noble and warriors khatriya sariput and moggallana brahmins by birth because of their long standing aspirations in former lives became the chief disciples of the buddha the former excelled in wisdom panya and the latter in supernormal powers iddi the buddha never wished to extract from his disciples blind and submissive faith in him or his teaching he always insisted on discriminative examination and intelligent inquiry in no uncertain terms he urged critical investigation when he addressed the inquiring kalamas in a discourse that has been rightly called the first charter of free thought come kalamas do not go by oral tradition by lineage of teaching by hearsay by a collection of scriptures by logical reasoning by inferential reasoning by reflecting on reasons by the acceptance of view after pondering it by the seeming competence of a speaker or because you think the ascetic is our teacher but when you know for yourself these things are unwholesome these things are blamable these things are censored by the wise these things if undertaken and practiced lead to harm and suffering then you should abandon them and when you know for yourself these things are wholesome these things are blameless these things are praised by the wise these things if undertaken and practiced lead to welfare and happiness then you should engage in them to take anything on trust is not in the spirit of buddhism so we find this dialogue between the master and the disciples if now knowing this and perceiving this would you say we honor our master and through respect for him we respect what he teaches no lord that which you affirm o disciples is it not only that which you yourself have recognized seen and grasped yes lord the buddha face facts and refused to acknowledge or yield to anything that did not accord with truth he does not want us to recognize anything indiscriminately and without reason he wants us to comprehend things as they really are to put forth the necessary effort and work out our own deliverance with mindfulness you should make the effort the tathagatas point out the way bestir yourself 
rise up and yield your hearts unto the buddha's teaching shake off the armies of the king of death as does the elephant a reed thatched shed the buddha for the first time in the world history taught that deliverance should be sought independent of a saver be he human or divine the idea that another raises a man from lower to high level of life and ultimately rescues him tends to make man indolent and weak supine and foolish this kind of belief disgrades a man and smothers every spark of dignity from his moral being the enlightened one exhorts his followers to acquire self reliance others may lend us a helping hand indirectly but deliverance from suffering must be wrought out and passioned by each one for himself upon the anvil of his own actions through purification in the understanding of things neither belief nor fear plays any role in buddhist thought the truth of the dhamma can be grasped only through insight never through blind faith or through fear of some known or unknown being not only did the buddha discourage blind belief and fear of an omnipotent god as unsuitable approaches for understanding the truth but he also denounced adherence to unprofitable rites and rituals because the mere abandoning of outward things such as fasting bathing in rivers animal sacrifice and similar acts does not tend to purify a man or make a man holy and noble we find this dialogue between the buddha and the brahmin sundarika bharadwaja once the buddha addressing the monks explained in detail how a seeker after deliverance should train himself and further added that a person whose mind is free from taints whose life of purity is perfected and the task done could be called one who bathes inwardly then bharadwaja seated near the buddha heard these words and asked him does the venerable gotama go to bathe in the river bahuka brahmin what good is the river bahuka what can the river bahuka do indeed venerable gotama the river bahuka is believed by many to be holy many people have their evil deeds papa washed away in the river bahuka then the buddha made him understand that bathing in rivers would not cleanse a man of his dirt of evil and instructed him thus bathe just here in this doctrine and discipline dhamma vine brahmin give security to all beings if you do not speak falsehood or kill or steal if you are confident and are not mean what does it avail you to go to gaya the name of a river in india during the time of the buddha your well at home is also a gaya caste problem caste which was a matter of vital importance to brahmins of india was one of utter indifference to the buddha who strongly condemned the debasing caste system in his order of monks all caste unite as do the rivers in the sea they lose their former names caste and clans and become known as members of one community the sangha speaking of the equal recognition of all members of the sangha the buddha says just as amongst the great rivers ganga yamuna achiravati sarabhu and mahi 
on reaching the ocean lose their earlier name and identity and come to be reckoned as the great ocean similarly o monk people of the four caste one who leave the household and become homeless recluses under the doctrine and discipline declared by the tathagata lose their previous names and identities and are reckoned as recluses who are sons of sakya udana 55 the buddhist position regarding racism and racial discrimination made explicit at such an early age is one reflected in the moral and scientific standpoint adopted by unesco in the present century declaration on race and racial prejudice unesco 1978 to sundarika paribraja the brahmin who inquired about his lineage the buddha answered no brahmin i no prince no farmer no aught else all world ranks i know but knowing go my way as simply nobody homeless in pilgrim garb with seven crown i go my way alone serene to ask my birth is vain on one occasion a caste ridden brahmin insulted the buddha saying stop you sevlin stop you outcast the master without any feeling of indignation gently replied birth makes not a man an outcast birth makes not a man a brahmin action makes a man outcast action makes a man brahmin sutta nipata 142 he then delivered a whole sermon the vasala sutta explaining to the brahmin in detail the characteristics of one who is really an outcast vasala convinced the haughty brahmin took refuge in the buddha the buddha freely admitted into the order people from all caste and classes when he knew that they were fit to live the holy life and some of them later distinguished themselves in the order the buddha was the only contemporary teacher who endeavored to blend in mutual tolerance and concord those who hitherto had been rent asunder by differences of caste and class upali who was the chief authority on the vinaya the disciplinary rules of the order was a barber regarded as one of the best occupation of the lower classes sunita who later won arahant ship was a scavenger another base occupation in the order of nuns were punna and punnika both slave girls according to mrs c a f reese davis 8.5% of number of those nuns who were able to realize the fruit of their training were drawn from the despised caste which were mostly illiterate chief disciples rajaga the capital of the kingdom of magadha was one of the first places visited by the buddha soon after his enlightenment as a wandering ascetic in the early days of his renunciation he had promised king senia bimbisara that he would visit rajaga when he achieved the object of his search king bimbisara was overjoyed at the sight of the buddha and having listened to his teaching became a lay follower his devotion to the buddha became so ardent that within a few days he offered him his pleasure park velwana for residence 
Rajaga during that time was a center of great learning where many schools of philosophy flourished. One such school of thought had as its head Sanjaya, and among his retinue of 250 followers were Upatissa and Kolita, who were later to become Sariputta and Mahamoggallana the two chief disciples of the Buddha. One day when Upatissa was walking through the streets of Rajaga, he was greatly struck by the serene countenance and the quiet dignified deportment of one of the first disciples of the Buddha, the Arahant Asaji, who was on his arms round. All these trainers endeavors to achieve perfection that Upatissa had made through many births were now on the verge of being rewarded. Without going back to his teacher, he followed the Arahat Asaji to his resting place, eager to know whom he followed and what teaching he had accepted. Friend, said Upatissa, serene is your countenance, clear and radiant is your glance. Who persuaded you to renounce the world? Who is your teacher? What Dhamma teaching do you follow? The Venerable Asaji, rather reluctant to speak much, humbly said, I cannot expound the doctrine and discipline at length, but I can tell you, the meaning briefly. Upatissa's reply is interesting. Well, friend, tell little or much. What I want is just the meaning. Why speak many words? Then the Arahans Asaji uttered a single verse which embraces the Buddha's entire doctrine of causality. Ye Dhamma Hetu Pabhava Tesang hetun tatagato ah, tesang cayo nirodo, evang wadi maha samano. Whatever from a cause proceeds, thereof the tatagata has explained the cause. Its cessation too he has explained. This is the teaching of the supreme sage. Upatissa instantly grasps the meaning and attains the first stage of realization, comprehending whatever is of the nature of arising, all that is of the nature of ceasing. With a heart full of joy, he quickly went back to his friend Kolita and told him of his meeting with the Arahat and of the teaching he had received. Kolita to like Upatissa instantly gained the first stage of realization, having heard the Dhamma from his friend. Thereon both of them approached Sanjay and asked him to follow the Buddha. But afraid of losing his reputation as a religious teacher, he refused to do so. Upatissa and Kolita then left Sanjay much against his protestations for the Veluana monastery and expressed their wish to become followers of the Buddha. The Buddha gladly welcomed them, saying, Come, monk, well proclaimed is the Dhamma. Live the holy life for the complete ending of suffering. He admitted them into the order. They attained deliverance and became the two chief disciples. Another great one who joined the order during the Buddha's stay at Veluana was the Brahmin sage Mahakasapa, who had renounced great wealth to find the way to deliverance. It was the Venerable Mahakasapa, three months after the Buddha's passing away, Parinibbana, who called up the convocation of Arahans, the first council at the Sattapanni cave near Rajaga under the patronage of King Ajasattu to collect 
and codify the Dhamma and Vine. The Order of Nuns In the early days of the order, only men were admitted to the Sangha since the Buddha was reluctant to admit women. But there were many devout women among the lay followers who had a keen desire for a life of renunciation as nuns. Urged by their keenness, Pajapati Gotami, the first mother of the Buddha, in the company of many ladies of rank, approached the Buddha, beseeching him to grant them ordination. But the Buddha still hesitated to accept them. See in their discomfiture and urged by their zeal, the Venerable Ananda took up their cause and pleaded with the Buddha on their behalf. The Buddha finally yielded to this appeal, placing, however, eight cardinal rules on the ordination of women. Thus was established in the fifth year after his enlightenment the order of nuns, the Bhikkhuni Sasana. For the first time in history, for never before this had there been an order when women could lead a celibate life of renunciation. Women from all walks of life joined the order. Foremost in the order stood the Theris, Kema and Uppalavanna. The lives of quite a number of these noble nuns, their strenuous endeavors to win the goal of freedom and their peons of joy at deliverance of mind are graphically described in the Terigata, the slums of sisters at Kapilavatu. While at Rajaga, the Blessed One heard that his father wished to see him and he set out for Kapilavatu. He did not however go straight to the palace but according to custom stopped in a grove outside the town. The next day the Buddha with his ball went for his arms from house to house in the streets of Kapilavatu. King Suddho then startled at the news rushed to the Buddha and said, Why, Master, why do you put us to shame? Why do you go begging for your food? Not one of our race has ever done so. Replied the Buddha, You and your family may claim descent from kings. My descent is from the Buddhas of old, and they begin their food always live on arms. Then explaining the Dhamma, the Master said, Be alert, be mindful, lead a righteous life. The righteous live happily both in this world and the next. And so the king became established in the path. He realized the Dhamma. The Buddha was then conducted into the palace where all came to pay their respect to him, but not Princess Yasodhara. The Buddha went to her and the princess, knowing the impassable gulf between them, fell on the ground at his feet and saluted him. They relating the Chanda Kinnara Jataka story of his previous birth, Revealing how great her virtue had been in that former life, he made her an ardent to the doctrine. Later, when the Buddha was induced to establish an order for women, Yasodhara became one of the first nuns and attained Arahantship higher sanctity. When the Buddha was in the palace, Princess Yasodhara arrayed her son Rahula in all his best attire and sent him to the Blessed One, saying, That is your father, Rahula. Go and ask for your inheritance. Prince Rahula went to the Buddha. 
stood before him and said pleasant indeed is your shadow sage and when the blessed one had finished his meal and left the palace prince rahul followed him saying give me my inheritance sage give me my inheritance at that blessed one spoke to the venerable sariputta well then sariputta take him into the order then the venerable sariputta gave prince rahul the ordination in the majjhima nikaya one of the five original collections in pali containing the buddha's discourses there are three discourses numbers 61 62 and 147 entitled rahulo vada or exhortations to rahul delivered by the blessed one to teach the dhamma to little rahul the discourses are entirely devoted to advice on discipline and meditation here is an extract from the master's exhortation in the maha rahulo vada sutra cultivate the meditation on loving kindness metta rahul for by cultivating loving kindness ill will is banished cultivate the meditation on compassion karuna rahul for by cultivating compassion cruelty is banished cultivate the meditation on appreciative joy mudita rahul for by cultivating appreciative joy aversion is banished cultivate the meditation on equanimity upekka rahul for by cultivating equanimity hatred is banished cultivate the meditation on impurity asubha rahul for by meditating on impurity lust is banished cultivate the meditation on the concept of impermanence anicca sanya rahul for by meditating on the concept of impermanence pride of self asmimana is banished cultivate the meditation on mindfulness of in and out breathing ana parsati rahul for mindfulness of breathing cultivated and frequently practice bears much fruit and is of great advantage women in buddhism generally speaking during the time of the buddha owing to brahminical influence women were not given much recognition sometimes they were held in contempt and in servility to men it was the buddha who raised the status of women and there were cases of women showing erudition in matters of philosophy in his large heartedness and magnanimity he always treated women with consideration and civility and pointed out to them to the path to peace purity and sanctity said the blessed one a mother is the friend at one's home a wife is the highest friend of the husband the buddha did not reject the invitation for a meal though ambapali was of bad repute whatever food she offered he accepted and in return gave her the dhamma dana the gift of truth she was immediately convinced by the teaching and leaving aside her frivolous lay life she entered the order of nuns ardent and strenuous in her religious practices she then became an arahant kisa gautami was another woman to whom the buddha gave the assistance of his great compassion her story is one of the most touching tales recorded in our books many more are the instances where the buddha helped and consoled women who suffered from the vicissitudes of life ministering to the sick great indeed was the master's compassion for the sick 
upon one occasion the blessed one found an ailing monk putigata tissa with festering ulcers lying on his soiled bed immediately the master prepared hot water and with help of the venerable ananda washed him tenderly nursed him with his own hands and taught the dhamma thus enabling him to win arahantship before he died on another occasion too the master tended a sick monk and admonished his disciples thus whosoever monk would follow my admonition would wait upon me would honor me he should wait upon the sick when the arahant tis passed away the funeral rites were duly performed and the buddha caused the relics to be enshrined in a stupa the buddha's metta or loving kindness was all pervading and immeasurable his earnest exhortation to his disciples was just as with her own life a mother shields from hurt her own her only child let all embracing thoughts for all that lives be thine being one who always acted in constant conformity with what is preached loving kindness and compassion always dominated his actions while journeying from village to village from town to town instructing enlightening and gladdening the many the buddha so how superstitious folk steeped in ignorance slaughtered animals in worship of their gods he spoke to them of life which all can take but none can give life which all creatures love and strive to keep wonderful dear and pleasant unto each even to the meanest thus when people who prayed to the gods for mercy were merciless and india was blood stained with the morbid sacrifices of innocent animals at the desecrated altars of imaginary deities and the harmful rites and rituals of ascetics and brahmins brought disaster and brutal agony the buddha the compassionate one pointed out the ancient path of the enlightened ones the path of righteousness love and understanding metta or love is the best antidote for anger in oneself it is the best medicine for those who are angry with us let us then extend love to all who need it with a free and boundless heart the language of the heart the language that comes from the heart and goes to the heart is always simple graceful and full of power economity and self composer amid all vicissitudes of life gain and loss repute and ill repute praise and censor pain and happiness the buddha never wavered he was firm as a solid rock touched by happiness or by pain he showed neither elation nor depression he never encouraged wrangling and animosity addressing the monks he once said i do not quarrel with the world monks it is the world that quarrels with me an exponent of the dhamma does not quarrel with anyone in the world he admonished his disciples in these words monks if others were to speak ill of me or ill of the dhamma or ill of the sangha the order you should not on that account 
entertain thoughts of enmity and spite and be worried if monks you are angry and displeased with them it will not only impede your mental development but you will also fail to judge how far that speech is right or wrong you should unravel what is untrue and make it all clear also monks if others speak highly of me highly of the dhamma and the sangha you need not on that account be elated for that too will mar your inner development you should acknowledge what is right and show the truth of what has been said there never was an occasion when the buddha manifested unfriendliness towards anyone even to his opponents and enemies there were those who opposed him and his doctrine yet the buddha never regarded them as enemies when others reproach him in strong terms the buddha neither manifested anger nor aversion nor uttered an unkind word but said as an elephant in the battlefield endures the arrows shot from a bow even so will i endure abuse and unfriendly expressions of others devadatta a striking example of this mental attitude is seen in his relation with devadatta devadatta was a cousin of the buddha who entered the order and gained supernormal powers of the mundane plane putujjana iddhi later however he began to harbor thoughts of jealousy and ill will towards his kinsman the buddha and his two chief disciples sariputta and mahamoggallana with the ambition of becoming the leader of the sangha the order of monks devadatta wormed himself into the heart of ajasattu the young prince the son of king bimbisara one day when the blessed one was addressing a gathering at the veluvana monastery where the king too was present devadatta approached the buddha saluted him and said venerable sir you are now enfeebled with age may the master lead a life of solitude free from worry and care i will direct the order the buddha rejected this overture and devadatta departed irritated and disconcerted nursing hatred and malice towards the blessed one then with the malicious purpose of causing mischief he went to prince ajasattu kindled in him the deadly embers of ambition and said young man you had better kill your father and assume kinship lest you die without becoming the ruler i shall kill the blessed one and become the buddha so when ajasattu murdered his father and ascended the throne devadatta suborn refrains to murder the buddha but failing in that endeavor he himself hurled down a rock as the buddha was climbing up gijjakuta hill in rajagaha the rock trembled down broke in two and a splinter slightly wounded the buddha later devadatta made an intoxicated elephant charge at the buddha but the animal prostrated himself at the master's feet overpowered by his loving kindness devadatta now proceeded to cause a schism in the sangha but this discord did not last long having failed in all his instigus devadatta retired a disappointed and broken man soon afterwards he fell ill and on his sick bed repenting his follies he desired to see the buddha but that was not to be 
for he died on the litter while being carried to the blessed one before his death however he uttered repentance and sought refuge in the buddha the last days the mahaparinibbana sutta the discourse on the passing away of the blessed one records in moving detail all the event that occurred during the last month and days of the buddha's life the blessed one had now reached the ripe age of 80 his two chief disciples sariputta and mahamoggallana had passed away 3 months earlier prajapati gotami yasodara and rahula were also no more the buddha was now at vesali and the rainy season having come he went together with a great company of monks to belua to spend the rains there there a severe sickness fell upon him causing him much pain and agony but the blessed one mindful and self possessed bore it patiently he was on the verge of death but he felt he should not pass away without taking leave of the order so with a great effort of will he suppressed that illness and kept his hold on life his sickness gradually abated and when quite recovered he called the venerable ananda his personal attendant and addressing him said ananda i am now grown old and full of years my journey is drawing to a close i have reached my sum of days i am turning 80 years of age and just as a worn out cart ananda can only with much additional care be made to move along so the body of the tathagata can only be kept going with much infusion of will power it is only when the tathagata ceases to attend to any outward things and to experience any worldly sensation attains to the signless animitta concentration of mind and dwells in it it is only then that the body of the tathagata is at ease therefore ananda be islands unto yourselves be your own refuge have recourse to none else for refuge hold fast to the dhamma as an island hold fast to the dhamma as a refuge resort to no other refuge whosoever ananda either now or after i am gone shall be islands unto themselves refuge unto themselves shall seek no external refuge it is the ananda among my disciples who shall reach the very topmost height but they must be keen to progress from belwa the buddha journeyed to the mahavana and they are calling up an assembly of all monks residing in the neighborhood of vesali address them saying disciples the dhamma realized by me i have made known to you make yourselves masters of the dhamma practice it meditate upon it and spread it abroad out of pity for the world for the good and the gain and welfare of gods and men the buddha concluded his exhortation by saying my age is now full ripe my life draws to its close i leave you i depart relying on myself alone be earnest then or disciples holy full of thought be steadfast in resolve keep watch over your own hearts who worries not but hold fast to this truth and law shall cross this sea of life shall make an end of grief 
worn out with sickness with feeble limbs the blessed one now journeyed on which much difficulty followed by the venerable ananda and a great company of monks even in this last long wearisome journey of his the buddha never failed in his attention to others he instructed chunda the smith who offered him his last meal then on the way he stopped for pukusa a disciple of alara kalama replied to all his questions and so instructed him that pukusa offered himself as a follower of the buddha the dhamma and the sangha the blessed one now reached the sala grove of the mallas at kusinara the journey's end knowing that here would be his last resting place he told the venerable ananda i am weary ananda and would lie down spread over for me the couch with its head to the north between the twin sala trees he then lay down on his right side composed and mindful with one leg resting on the other speaking now to the venerable ananda the blessed one said they who fulfill the greater and lesser duties they who are correct in life walking according to the precepts it is they who rightly honor reverence and venerate the tathagata the perfect one with the worthiest homage therefore ananda be steady in the fulfillment of greater and the lesser duties and be correct in life walking according to the precepts thus ananda should you train yourselves the last convert at that time a wandering ascetic named subadha who was at kusinara heard the news of the blessed one's approaching death and in order to clear up certain doubts that troubled his mind he hurried to the sala grove to speak to the buddha the venerable ananda however did not wish the buddha to be disturbed in his last moments and though subadha made several appeals access to the master was refused the blessed one overheard the conversation he knew at once that subadha was making his investigations with a genuine desire for knowledge and knowing that subadha was capable of quickly grasping the answers he desired that subadha be allowed to see him subadha's uncertainty was whether the leaders of the other schools of thought such as purna kashyapa nigant nath putta and other had attained true understanding the blessed one then spoke in whatsoever doctrine and discipline dhamma vine subadha the noble eightfold path is not found neither in it is there found a man of true saintliness of the first or of the second or of the third or of the fourth degree and in whatsoever doctrine and discipline subadha the noble eightfold path is found in it is found the man of true saintliness of the first and the second and the third and the fourth degree now in this doctrine and discipline subadha is found the noble eightfold path and it to are found the men of true saintliness of all the four degrees wide are the systems of other teachers wide of true saints and in this one subadha may the brethren live the life that is right so that the world be not behalf of arahants here in the words of the blessed one subadha gained confidence and took refuge in the buddha the dhamma and the sangha 
Furthermore, he desires to be admitted into the order, and the Buddha requested the venerable Ananda to receive him. Subhadra thus became the last convert and the last disciple of the Blessed One, and before long, by his strenuous effort, he attained the final stage of arahatship. The last scene. Now the Blessed One addressing the Venerable Ananda said, I have taught the Dhamma Ananda without making any distinction between exoteric and esoteric doctrine. For in respect of the truth, Ananda, the Tathagata has no such things as the closed fist of a teacher who hides some essential knowledge from the pupil. It may be Ananda that in some of you the thought may arise, the word of the Master is ended. We have no teacher anymore, but it is not thus Ananda that you should think. The doctrine and the discipline which I have set forth and laid down for you, let them, after I am gone, be your teacher. It may be monks that there may be doubts in the minds of some bidran as to the Buddha or the Dhamma or the Sangha or the path, Magga or method, Patipada. Inqua monks freely do not have to reproach yourselves afterwards with the thought our teacher was face to face with us and we could not bring ourselves to inquire of the exalted one when we were face to face with him. When the Buddha had thus spoken, two monks were silent. A second and third time the Blessed One repeated these words to the monks, and yet the monks were silent. And the Venerable Ananda said to the Blessed One, How wonderful a thing is it, Lord! How marvelous! Truly, I believe that in this whole assembly of the monks there is not one who has any doubt or misgivings as to the Buddha or the Dhamma or the Sangha or the path or the method. The Blessed One confirms the word of the Venerable Ananda, adding that in the whole assembly, even the most backward one was assured of final deliverance. And after a short while, the Master made his final exhortation to those who wished to follow his teaching now and in the future. Behold now, O monks, I exhort you, impermanent are all compounded things, Work out your deliverance with mindfulness. Vaya Dhamma Sankara Appama Dena Sampadeta These were the last words of the Buddha. Then the Master entered into those nine successive stages of meditative absorption, jhana, which are of increasing sublimity. The first four fine material absorptions, Rupa Jhana, then the four immaterial absorptions, Arupa Jhana, and finally the state where perceptions and sensation entirely cease. Sanya Ved Ita Nirodha. Then he returned through all things stages to the first fine material absorption and rose again to the fourth one. Immediately after having re-entered this stage which has been described as having purity of mindfulness due to equanimity, the Buddha passed away. Parinibbhai. He realized Nibbana that is free from any substratum of further becoming. Parinibbhana. In the Mahaparinibbhana Sutta are recorded in moving details all the events that occurred during the last month and days of the master's life. In the annals of history, no man is recorded as having so 
consecrated himself to the welfare of all beings irrespective of caste class creed or sect as the supreme buddha from the hour of his enlightenment to the end of his life he strove tirelessly and unauthenticatedly to elevate humanity regardless of the fatigue involved and obvious to the many obstacles and handicaps that hampered his way he never relaxed in his exertion for the common weal and was never subjected to moral or spiritual fatigue though physically he was not always fit mentally he was ever vigilant and energetic therefore it is said a ah, wonderful is the conqueror who ever untiring strives for the blessings of all beings for the comfort of all lives though 25 centuries have gone since the passing away of the buddha his message of love and wisdom still exists in its purity decisively influencing the destinies of humanity forests of flowers are daily offered at his shrines and countless millions of lips daily repeat the formula buddham saranam gachami i take refuge in the buddha his greatness yet glows today like a sun that blots out lesser lights and his dhamma yet beckons the weary pilgrim to nibbana's security and peace